Good afternoon and welcome back. It's our fourth instalment of James and the Giant Peach. I wonder if you can remember what happened last time in the story. That's right. James and his aunts had noticed a peach growing on the tree in the garden. The tree that had never, ever had so much as a flower on it, let alone a peach. And the peach had grown and grown and grown until it was bigger than a small house. Aunt Spiker had a plan. Aunt Sponge's plan was to eat the peach. Aunt Spiker thought she might be able to make a little money out of it. Let's see what happens next. Chapter 8 The news that a peach, almost as big as a house, had suddenly appeared in someone's garden, spread like wildfire across the countryside. And the next day, a stream of people came scrambling up the steep hill to gaze upon this marvel. Quickly, Aunt Sponge and Aunt Spike had called in carpenters and had them build a strong fence around the peach to save it from the crowd. And at the same time, these two crafty women stationed themselves at the front gate with a large bunch of tickets and started charging everyone for coming in. Roll up, roll up, Aunt Spike yelled. Only one shilling to see the giant peach. Half price for children under six weeks old, Aunt Sponge shouted. One at a time, please. Don't push, don't push. You're all going to get in. Hey, you, come back there. You haven't paid. By lunchtime, the whole place was a seething mass of men, women and children, all pushing and shoving to get a glimpse of this miraculous fruit. Helicopters were landing like wasps all over the hill and out of them poured swarms of newspaper reporters, cameramen and men from television companies. And you see, there's the helicopters and there's Aunt Sponge and Aunt Spiker charging all the people to come into their garden. It'll ask you double to bring in a camera, Aunt Spiker shouted. All right, all right, they shouted. We don't care. And the money came rolling into the pockets of the two greedy aunts. While all this excitement was going on outside, poor James was forced to stay locked in his bedroom, peeping through the bars of his windows at the crowds below. The disgusting little brute will only get in everyone's way if we let him wander about, Aunt Spiker had said early that morning. Oh, please, he had begged. I haven't met any other children for years and years, and there are going to be lots of them down there for me to play with. And perhaps I could help you sell tickets? Shut up! Up, Aunt Sponge had snapped. Your Aunt Spiker and I are about to become millionaires. And the last thing we want is the likes of you messing things up and getting in the way. Later, when the evening of the first day came and the people had all gone home, the ants unlocked James's door and ordered him to go up outside and pick all the banana skins and orange peels and bits of paper that the crowd had left behind. Could I please have something to eat first? He asked. I haven't had a thing all day. No, they shouted, kicking out of the door. We're too busy to make food. We're counting on money. But it's dark, cried James. Get out, they cried, and stay out until you've cleaned up all the mess. The door slammed. The key turned in the lock. Chapter 9 Hungry and trembling, James stood alone out in the open wondering what to do. The night was all around him now and high overhead a wild white moon was riding in the sky. There was not a sound, not a movement anywhere. Most people, and especially small children, are often quite scared of being outdoors in the moonlight. Everything is so deadly quiet and the shadows are so long and black. And they keep turning into strange shapes that seem to move when you look at them. And the slightest little snap of a twig makes you jump. Look at the enormous peach. There's little James. Look how big that peach is. James felt exactly like that now. He stared straight ahead with large frightened eyes, hardly daring to breathe. Not far away in the middle of the garden, he could see the giant peach towering over everything else. Surely it was even bigger tonight than ever before. And what a dazzling sight it was. The moonlight was shining and glinting on its great curving sides, turning them to crystal and silver. 
It looked like a tremendous silver ball lying there in the grass, silent and mysterious and wonderful. And then, all at once, little shivers of excitement started running all over James's skin on his back. Something else, he told himself. Something stranger than ever this time is about to happen to me again soon. He was sure of it. He could feel it coming. He looked around him, wondering what on earth it was going to be. The garden lay soft and silver in the moonlight. The grass was wet with dew, and a million dewdrops were sparkling and twinkling like diamonds around his feet. And now, suddenly, the whole place, the whole garden seemed to be alive with magic. Almost without knowing what he was doing, as though drawn by some powerful magnet, James Henry Trotter started walking slowly towards the giant peach. He climbed over the fence that surrounded it and stood directly beneath it, staring up its great bulging sides. He put one, put out a hand and touched it gently with the tip of one finger. It felt soft and warm, slightly furry, like the skin of a baby mouse. He moved a step closer and rubbed his cheek lightly against the soft skin. And then suddenly, while he was doing this, he happened to notice that right beside him and below him, close to the ground, there was a hole in the side of the peach. Chapter 10 It was quite a large hole, the sort of thing an animal about the size of a fox might have made. James knelt down in front of it and poked his head and shoulders inside. He crawled in. He kept on crawling. This is the hole, he thought excitedly. It's a tunnel. The tunnel was damp and murky and all around him there was a curious bittersweet smell of fresh peach. The floor was soggy under his knees. The walls were sweet and sticky and peach juice was dripping from the ceiling. James opened his mouth and caught some of it on his tongue. It tasted delicious. He was crawling uphill now, as though the tunnel were leading straight towards the very centre of the gigantic fruit. Every few seconds he paused and took a bite out of the wall. The peach flesh was sweet and juicy and marvellously refreshing. He crawled on for several more yards and then suddenly, bang, the top of his head bumped into something extremely hard, blocking his way. He glanced up and in front of him there was a solid wall that seemed at first as though it was made of wood. He touched it with his fingers. It certainly felt like wood, except it was very jagged and full of deep grooves. Good heavens, he said, I know what this is. I've come to the stone in the middle of the peach. Then he noticed that there was a small door cut into the face of the peach stone. He gave a push. It swung open. He crawled through it and before he had time to glance up and see where he was, he heard a voice saying, look who's here. And another one said, we've been waiting for you. James stopped and stared at the speakers, his face white with horror. He started to stand up, but his knees were shaking so much he had to sit down again on the floor. He glanced behind him, thinking he could bolt back out the tunnel the way he'd come. But the doorway had disappeared. There was now only a solid brown wall behind him. And that is where we're going to leave it for now.
tomorrow I'll read you chapter 11. And let's find out who he's talking to. I hope you enjoyed that. Goodbye.